Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Keith, Scott, we're all glad you're here. We're all here today to study lesson number seven. Scott, would you lead us in prayer? Certainly. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this privilege of uh, meeting on your Sabbath day. We ask you that you bless the words that we're going to speak, that you send your Holy Spirit to open our minds and the minds of our listeners. We help you that you, we ask you that you give us um, your grace as we speak the truth about your law and the book of Deuteronomy. In your name we pray, amen. The exciting news today is that we're going to be studying law and grace. And so let's just jump right into our memory verse, which says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through law, then Christ died in vain. So that's a beautiful scripture, isn't it? It's God, if, if it weren't for, Christ would have died in, in vain if it wasn't for his grace. And so, um, and the law can't, is not what saves us. It's that grace of God. But the commentary on the book of Deuteronomy is perhaps more than any other book of the Old Testament, the book in which grace and law are wrapped together in such a way that it would be difficult to sep separate them. When Moses speaks about the law, he thinks essentially of grace. And so his whole concept of the law is grace. Where we kind of separate the two and look at them differently, <clears throat> Moses didn't. He saw the law as grace. Law is understood in the book of, Mar of the Mark of the Covenant. Therefore, law and grace are related both from divine and human perspectives. Now, the lesson talks about most Christians being understanding the relation, the correlation between law and grace, and I would like to disagree because I think a lot of Christians struggle with that relationship, the relationship between the two. And um, because I have heard those who say it's all about grace, you don't have to keep the law, and I have heard those say that you have to keep the law and completely forget about it, the grace part. So it is a balance that we um, need to look at and understand. So the law is God's standard of holiness and righteousness, and violation of that law is sin. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And because we have all violated that law, Scripture says in Galatians 3, 22, but the scripture has confined all under sin. The promise of faith in Christ might be given to those who believe. So we have all sinned. Every single one of us who've, who've lived have sinned. We only have one who did not, and that was Christ. Said It is only through God's grace that, that we can be saved. I keep saying that over and over, don't I? For by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourself. It is a gift of God. And that is Ephesians 2.8. Yet, God's grace does not negate the law. And here we look at this correlation about we don't have to keep the law. It's all grace. But, but Paul tells us, no, you can't negate the law because of grace. It says, in Romans 3.31, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Even those who believe in keeping the law find there is a slight de derail or detail when it comes to the seventh-day Sabbath as part of the law. Yet, various, for various reasons, many Christians are determined, at least for now, to reject the seventh-day Sabbath. They come up with all kinds of excuses to justify their rejection. And I have <coughs> experienced this with so many people and, and friends. I, I used to, many years ago, I, I studied with a group of, of girls, and we were 
pretty much an interfaith group. But um, when I first started talking to them about the Sabbath, they were like, wait a minute, you're a legalist. If you keep the Sabbath, you're just a legalist. Yet these same people would never think of breaking any of the other commandments. They wouldn't lie. They wouldn't cheat. They wouldn't, um, they wouldn't do, uh, commit murder. They wouldn't um, even think of breaking any of the other commandments. And then I've had people tell me that Sabbath was made for man so we can worship whatever day we want because it's, it's, it's our choice. And then I've heard that the Sabbath is done away with. And I'm sure all of you have heard many of these, these issues around the Sabbath as well. So many of you as keepers of the law have often been accused of being a legalist, as I was, without soul or without intelligence, a disciple of a backward religion. This charge is unfair. The law as it is understood in Israel, implies, on the contrary, a light that helps one's spiritual walk and promotes progress. The psalmist compares the law as, in Psalms 119.105, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So this lesson is contained in the Hebrew word Torah, which is related to the word or meaning light. So when one is walking on a path by, by night, a lamp is what goes before them at their feet so that they will not um, fall off the path. But it also scares away animals and serpents and things like that as you're walking on the path. The image of the poet thereby translated the double function of the law to enlighten, to teach, and therefore to help one to walk forward, and to protect from danger, and to ensure safety of the one on the walk. The prophet Isaiah brings up the same association when he says that if people are without the law, there is no light in them. So the law that is light is an expression of God's grace for his people. This light will help us walk and to those who survive on the dangers of the dark way. In that sense, the law is given that we may live. As we um, look at this, there's also another aspect to the law, and that is as a mirror. Um, Ellen White says in First Selected Messages, page 219, the law of God reaches to those secret purposes which, though they may be sinful, are often passed over lightly, but which are in reality the basis and the test of character. It is the mirror into which the sinner is to look if he would have a correct knowledge of his moral character. And when he sees himself condemned, by the great standard of righteousness, his next move must be to repent his sins and seek forgiveness through Christ. Failing to do this may try to break the mirror which reveals their defects. So if we fail to look at our sin and to look at, at our life, it's like we just forget the mirror. We break the mirror and then we don't have any defects. To make void the law which points to the blemishes in life and character. So the law is a law of love, and I've always talked about, in other lessons we've talked about the law, and I call it God's love language. And it provides light to shine before us and a mirror to reflect our mistakes. It is this law that shows the way we are to lead our lives, but it is only the grace of Christ that has the power to save us. And I would also like to add that it's only the grace of Christ that gives us power to keep those commandments. So in this lesson, we're going to examine the paradoxical relationship between the law and the grace of God. So Scott, would you like to tell us about, more about the law in Deuteronomy? Certainly. So Monday's lesson <laughs> talks about the law portion in Deuteronomy. Um, so... I'm going to read the introduction from the Sabbath School lesson, which says, The Hebrew nation 
on the borders of Canaan, God's chosen people are finally about to inherit the land God had promised them. And, as we have seen, Deuteronomy is Moses' final instructions to the Hebrews before they take the land. Among those instructions were the commandments to obey. And then it gives a list of texts, so I'm going to go through these texts. I'll try to do it relatively quickly. So Deuteronomy 4.44 says, Now this is the law which Moses set before the sons of Israel. And 17.19 says, And it shall be with him that he shall read it all the days of his lives, life so that he will learn to fear the Lord God and by carefully following all the, law, all the words of the law and these statutes. And then Deuteronomy 28, 58, and I added 59 because I found it apropos to our current situation. If you are not careful to follow all the words of the law that are written in this book, to fear this honored and awesome name, then the Lord God will bring extraordinary plagues on you and your descendants, severe and lasting plagues and miserable and chronic sicknesses. So apparently obeying God's law will also prevent you from getting plagues and sicknesses. So anyway, I thought that was an interesting point. Mm -hmm. So then we'll go on to Deuteronomy 30, um, verses 8 to 14. And again, obey the Lord and follow his commandments, which I am commanding you today. Then the Lord will prosper you abundantly in every work of your hand, in the children of your womb, the offspring of your cattle, and the produce of your ground. For the Lord again will rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. And if you obey the Lord God to keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in the book of the law, if you turn to the Lord God, with all your heart and soul. For this commandment, which I am commanding you today, is not too difficult for you, nor is it far away. It is not in heaven that you could say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us and proclaim it to us that we may follow it. Nor is it beyond the sea, so you could say, who will cross the sea for us and get it and proclaim it to us that we may follow it. On the contrary, the word is very near you, in your mouth, in your heart, that you may follow it. So I found that that part, um, verses 11 through 14, was interesting to me because um, God is basically saying that what I'm commanding you is not impossible to do, because if it were impossible, um, how could I expect you to do this? So I think the, the part that many people get wrong is that Perfection in the Christian character is not something you can do of yourself, but you are to do it nonetheless through the, through the grace of Christ, as we'll find out in a little bit. Um, so, Deuteronomy 31, 12, and I, I put it 12 to 14 here uh, on the section because we've got some extra interesting things in there. Assemble the people, the men, the women, the children, and the stranger who is in your town, so that he may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God and be careful to follow all of the words of this law. And their children who have not known will hear and learn to fear the Lord God as long as you live on the land which you are about to cross the Jordan to possess. And then the last verse was Deuteronomy 32, 46 and 47. Oh, actually, second to the last one. He said to them, take, take to your heart all the words which I am warning you today, which you will command your sons to follow, and all the words of the law. For it is not a trivial matter to you. Indeed, it is your life. And by this word you will prolong your days in the land which you are about to cross in the Jordan to possess. Uh, now this is the blessing. Now th this is the last verse, which is Deuteronomy thirty-three two, um, and I, I'm reading two to four. Now this is the blessing which Moses, the man of God, blessed the sons of Israel before his death. He said, "The Lord came from Sinai, and dawned from Mount Seir. He shone from Mount Paran, and he came in the midst of myriads of the holy ones." At his right hand were flash, flashing lightning for them, 
Indeed, he loves the people. All your holy ones are in your hand, and they followed in your steps. Everyone takes of your word. Moses issued to us the law, a possession for the assembly of Jacob. And then um, I was going to look up and bring the, the verses of Romans 21 through 31. So I think Paul makes some interesting points here, which is basically that um, there's a difference between obeying the law and between claiming that obeying the law is um, that you deserve to be rewarded for that. Um, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who um, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace, grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate righteousness because of His forbearance. God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time of his righteousness that he might be just and a justifier of the one who had faith in Jesus. Um, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? No, but the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or he is the God of, the, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is a, one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So the commentary that I was thinking about here is that faith itself is an antidote to both unbelief and presumption. So I think Satan has ever tried to um, push people into one wrong uh, interpretation or the other one. So Christ taught that you will know a, a tree by its fruit. Thus, obedience to the law is a fruit of having been grafted into Christ, whereas the fruit of disobedience is very different. We can also use the taking of the city of Jericho as an example of righteousness by faith. When Israel was first commanded to go into Canaan, they rebelled, saying that the walls of the cities were too high and that there were giants in the land. However, when obedient to God's command given through Joshua, the Israelites did not even have to fight to take the city, but rather only march around the city. Thus, the people of Israel were not to boast about this victory, nor to appropriate the spoils to themselves, but rather to God. In the same way, overcoming sin is impossible for us in our own power, as it, is, as it would have been for the Jews to have taken the city of Jericho in their own power. Yet, not taking the city as by the first generation of the Jews who came out of Egypt was also sinful. We are to overcome sin by the power of Jesus, but not to take credit for the achievements as though they were part of our great, our, through our own greatness, that we were able to achieve this. Uh, so the two types of errors in Christianity are, number one, unbelief, as evidenced by fa uh, failing to um, believe in the promises of God as did the Jews when they were commanded to go into uh, Canaan the first time, or two, by presumption as evidenced by the people of Israel who tried to take Canaan on their own, or Achan who took the spoils to himself. And so it is today that there are those who do not believe they can conquer sin, so that's really unbelief. And then there are those who think that God is so kind he will not punish their sin, which is presumption. Faith is the middle between these two errors, and it's the correct path. Faith is the mechanism by which we are enabled by God to keep his commandments. 
Thank you. So peace. People are kind of surprised when they hear that there was law in heaven. Do you yeah. want to talk to us about that? Yeah, there, there, there's a law in heaven. I, uh, I believe Ezekiel uh, chapter 28, uh, verse uh, 15 and 16 uh, talks about it. Um, it says, um, so I'm going to read it. You were blameless, blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. And I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. So it's, uh, it talks about, uh, this uh, verse talks about the uh, uh, story of a Lucifer in, uh, in heaven, and the, um, um, everything was going, uh, going well until the day, the time when uh, Lucifer decided that, uh, you know, uh, to be more selfish and, um, and uh, was kicked out. And uh, the verse here, it says, uh, till wickedness was found in you and you sinned. And so uh, what is uh, sin? It's uh, going against the law of, uh, law of God. And uh, so apparently um, because from what they're saying there is that they're, they're Lucifer sinned, which means that there had to be a law that he uh, breached. So I, I believe that was the, that was the law. Yeah. Yeah. There was, that was his law because he wouldn't have fallen if there wasn't a, a, a way to sin. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so the law was present in heaven yeah. or he wouldn't have been able to transgress it. Yeah, I think so. I, um, Although I do kind of a wonder, um, it's I may be uh, going a little off topic here, but the uh, sometimes I wonder what the law was actually. Like uh, you know, is it what it did? Was it the same as the Ten Commandments, um, or was it something else? Or is the law something uh, more intrinsic? Uh, but uh, well, we know that the Bible says, mm -hmm. "I am I am the Lord; I do not change." Okay, and so. He wouldn't ask uh, uh, different groups of people to keep different mm -hmm. laws. Okay. And so the angels mm -hmm. that are in heaven now mm -hmm. have just never sinned. Okay. They've understood this. And really, um, and we're going to get into this a bit on Tuesday's lesson, mm -hmm. but really the law is just a peaceful and joyful way to, to live. Yeah, I think so. Maybe, uh, you know, before the creation, you know, remember, uh, you know, Sabbath uh, might not have been there because it was a before creation, but I suppose the law that the goodness of God was there and the Ten Commandments was uh, created for our benefit after the creation, I guess. Yeah. Well, but, you, have, you have to yeah. remember, too. Just a second. Sorry. Um, you have to remember, too, that Satan was a covering cherub. Mm -hmm. And the cherubs... Covering cherubs, where did they where did they live on this earth? In the ark, over they sat over the ark of the covenant, okay, which okay. where the law was kept. Mm -hmm, okay. So Satan understood God's law, okay, because he was a covering cherub. It was his job mm -hmm. to protect the law. Go ahead, Scott. Oh, so, so what what I was going to say is that I think that the the Ten Commandments are God's application of His law to this particular planet. But I think the, the, the basic two principles that um, Christ pointed out to the Pharisee who asked about it, which was love God supremely and love your neighbor as yourself, mm -hmm. I think those have always existed as long as God has existed. So I think that, for example, it says that angels do not marry or give in marriage, so then they know committing adultery wouldn't make sense to angels. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think he created the Sabbath well, there's at the time. spiritual adultery, though. True. <laughs> um, but also the Sabbath, I think, was created at the time of the creation of this world. Mm -hmm. So we're led to believe that the Sabbath was not um, in effect before he created this planet. So I, I, but I'm going to disagree. <laughs> okay. But I think we could go on with that one for a yeah, while. Yeah, we, we could but, go but, back uh, and forth But I think we would that. agree on the first two commandments. Absolutely. Love God. Well, that's how Christ summed them up is love, one is to love God and the other is, is, is how to, to uh, 
love, love man. But I believe that even in heaven, God wanted to spend time with his creation. And so I believe there was time set aside. That's why I believe that there was a Sabbath in heaven, because I believe just as God has set aside this time for us to commune with him, there was also a time for the angels to commune with him. So to me, that consistency makes more sense. We'll have to find out in heaven. We'll have to find out in heaven. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, the, the Ten Commandments as an application of um, God's goodness for us, I think it makes sense because the, uh, um, you know, at the time it was uh, given to the Israelites, so it had to be practical and something that had to be, can be practiced uh, on an everyday basis. So, yeah. So, all right. So, um, so I guess I'm uh, covering uh, Sunday, the rest of it. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You can keep going. Okay. So, um, yeah. And the, the lesson continues to stay uh, about the, uh, what sin is. It seems like uh, from uh, looking at Romans uh, chapter 7, verse uh, 7, um, it says, uh, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. And um, so it, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, um, trying to collect my thought here. <laughs> it's all right. So we just talked about that the law exists in heaven also. And the um and I'm thinking we also said that the um then angels know um they they must have known the law in order to know what sin is because the um um they know the law um and therefore they know what sin is. Um, because the Paul says that if he had not known what the law is, then he would not have um, known what the sin is. And um, sometimes it makes me wonder whether, you know, you are committing something, an act, uh, without you knowing, um, would that be considered um, offense or sin? And I suppose it could be, but... Um, um, may not be greater offense than other things that you do knowingly doing it, but maybe we'll, uh, we'll uh, find out in heaven, yeah. <laughs> well, God does say he winks at our ignorance, so, okay. so we're going we're gonna to hold him to that when, okay. when we get there. But, but mm -hmm. going back to this issue of if we hadn't coveted, we wouldn't have known what covetousness was. Mm -hmm. So that was Satan's really his biggest issue. The he, he was he wanted he coveted he wanted to be God he wanted to be God yeah mm -hmm. yeah he wanted to be God so and we know that he had an eye problem yeah the eye eye problem the eye in the middle yeah Listen, yeah mm -hmm. and so we can almost say that that was the the first big sin mm -hmm. in heaven yeah it's the uh, eye problem it's uh, the selfishness or the ego I suppose yeah. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, moving on to uh, the lesson, it talks about the, um, you know, how the law of God applies both in heaven and on earth. Um, taking from Ellen G. White's um, passage here uh, from the lesson, um, she says that the will of God is expressed in the precepts of his holy law, and the principles of, his, of this law are principles of heaven. The angels of heaven attain unto higher knowledge than to know the will of God and to do his will is the highest service that can engage their powers. So, yeah, I mean, uh, um, we can now know that, we, we know that the, um, um, that the law exists both in heaven and on earth and mm -hmm. uh, basic uh, principles uh, remain the same. Uh, even the... Uh, application might be different uh, yeah so and, and just one other thing about this heaven thing 
I, I, I believe when we get to heaven, mm-hmm. we'll all be living still under the same rules. I don't think, well, the, I don't think the angels are going to have to learn new rules when we get to heaven. True. Yeah. So, all right. <clears throat> now, we're going to move on to Tuesday. And Tuesday is an interesting title. Not only to try to figure out what it means, but also uh, just how to pronounce it. So I'm going to take a stab at it. Latav Lak. And it took me a little bit to figure out what this meant. Um, and I had to look, in the, look up in, in the Hebrew. But it basically means for good, for your, for your good, uh, for your own good, for your good. And then it also talked about pleasant, pleasant and agreeable. So really, when we look at the law, it's for our own good, and it is pleasant and agreeable when we live by it. So um, if we look at the lesson, it says skeptics, or those who look for reason to reject the Bible, often point to some strong words of God that appear in the Old Testament. The idea that the God of the Old Testament was harsh, vindictive, and mean-spirited, especially in contrast to Jesus. So I personally have heard this before. I've had friends who say, you know, I really can't believe the God of the Old Testament. He's not, he's not, my, he's not my God. The God of the New Testament, who is all love and, and, and caring, is, is, is the God that I, 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 I want to have in my life. But this isn't a new argument, and it's flawed as it was promoted for many, many centuries ago. Again, the Old Testament presents the Lord as loving his ancient people and wanting only what was best for them. And this love appears powerfully in the book of Deuteronomy. So let's jump in. We've got Deuteronomy here, 1 through 15. And as we read this, Moses is talking in the first person. Um, so it's, he's telling the story. And remember when they had come to uh, the mountain for the Ten Commandments? Um, When Moses came down the mountain the first time, he found them building the golden calf, which he was so upset he either dropped or smashed (laughs) the commandments. And so at the time, in verse 10 it says, At that time the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. Now, this is, a, this is really important because the commandments were so important he didn't transcribe them to Moses. He didn't say, okay, Moses, here, write these down. I'm going to give them to you. He didn't do that. He said, these are my commandments. These are important to me. These are the way I want you to live. I'm going to write these for you. And so God wrote those um, on the tablets. of uh, <clears throat> And I will write on the tablets that were on the first tablets, which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone, like the first, and went up to the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets, according to the first writing of the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord God gave them to me. So then I came and turned down the mountain, and put the tablets in the ark, which I had made. And they, there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. In verse 6, Now the children of Israel journeyed from Wells, ben Jachin to Moshe, where Aaron had died, and where he was buried, and Eliezer's son ministered as high priest instead. And from there they journeyed to Gadol, and from Gadol to Jathbath, a land of many rivers. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi 
to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord and to stand for the Lord, to minister unto him and to bless his name to this day. So we see that as the, as, as the, the work progressed, that he, the Levites actually then became the bear, bearers of the ark. Therefore, Levi has no portion or no inheritance with his brother, for the Lord is his inheritance, just as the Lord your God promised him. As at the first time I stayed in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord also heard me at that time, and the Lord chose not to destroy you. Because <clears throat> there was a question as to whether God, said, God was like, maybe I should just destroy these people and start over. But he did not. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, begin your journey, for the people that may go in and possess the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. God had quite a challenge with the, the Israelites through, through the desert. But now we're going to look at the essence of the law, and this is key. And so I want to, I want to go through this very carefully. And now, Israel, what does your Lord require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to your God, also the earth with all that is in it. So if we look at this law, God wants us to love his law. It's not just about keeping the law. It's about wanting to to serve him by the same kind of love that he gives to us. And so uh, the Lord delighted only in your fathers, verse 15, to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all people as it is this day. So God's grace and love for Israel exudes from these texts. All through the Hebrew verses, the words you and your are in a singular form. Though God certainly is speaking to the nation as a whole, what good will his word do if the people, each one individually, don't obey them? The whole is only as good as the sum of its parts. The Lord was speaking one-to-one, -one, individually, to Israel as a nation. We can't forget that either... <clears throat> The end of the 13th verse, keep these things, love talk, for your own good. Um, but God is commanding his people to obey because it is in their best interest to do so. So his, his, his reasoning is for their own good in doing this. Obedience to his law, to his Ten Commandments, can work only for our benefit. The law often has been compared to a hedge a wall of protection. By staying within the wall, God's followers are protected from a raft of evils that would otherwise overtake and destroy them. In short, out of love for his people, God gave them his law, and obedience to the law was for their own good. So, um, so this, this obedience is so important and it's not because when you, when you stop and look at families today and the things that are destroying, destructive and difficult for families, a lot, most often, there is some law of God or some, some commandment of God that has been broken that makes their life so difficult. And we see it over and over and over in life. So... Um, I do just want to share one more thing really quickly from uh, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. Israel had not perceived that the spiritual nature of the law and too often their professed obedience was but an observance of forms and ceremonies. Rather than surrender of the heart to the sovereignty, sovereignty of love, 
as Jesus in his character and worked represented to men the holy benevolent pattern attributes of God and presented the worthlessness of mere ceremonial obedience. The Jewish leaders did not receive or understand the words. They thought that he dwelt too lightly upon the requirements of the law, and when he set before them the very truths that were the soul of their divinely appointed service, they, looking only at the external, accused him and and sought to overthrow him. So we see that we can, the law is a balance. We need to do it in love. If we're doing it out of a legalism, as the Pharisees did, then um, they, we won't get that blessing. All right. Peace. A slave in Egypt. Yeah, this is an interesting uh, um topic is uh, I think it talks about the uh, so we've been talking about the uh, the law what is it um, you know the the essence or maybe the application of it uh, now this one talks about the um, the uh, more of a background um, of where this is coming from and um, I think it starts with the, uh, the story of uh, Israelites coming out of Egypt um, it's a story of uh, God's uh, grace. Uh, through his grace, they were delivered from us, uh, bondage. And, um, and the Lord made it happen, and he wanted people to remember. Um, uh, Micah chapter 6, verse 4. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, I redeemed you from the house of bondage. And so uh, I, I think it's uh, good to remember that because the... Um, um, you know, we're talking about the law, um, but also we're talking about the uh, beyond that, we're talking about the character of God and His grace and uh, through grace, uh, salvation. And it goes to, it's, it doesn't, the story doesn't remain in Old Testament, it uh, spills into New Testament. And, um, you know, we're talking about the uh, God's salvation. And Hebrew chapter eleven twenty nine, um, by faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempted, attempting to do so, were drowned. So um, I think it appears to me there's like a one uh, another element that was brought in, which is faith. So God through grace grants uh, redemption to Israel Israelites, and uh, they have to believe it. They have to have faith in order to claim the uh, the grace that is that God is uh, sending them. And uh, I think that is a uh, to me it's uh, it's an essential part. You have to have faith, and you actually believe in and claim it. And um, now the the lesson the today's uh, I mean the Wednesday's lesson also talks about the another point, which is to remember Sabbath, uh, which you know, we all know is a part of the Ten Commandments. And um, there's a part uh, where it says, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath holy. So this is a... um, new new element uh you know because for me you know sabbath means that the uh you know god created the uh the world in six days he rested and made it holy and so we keep the sabbath and uh oftentimes i do not remember um that the uh you know god had commanded them to keep the sabbath holy because uh, in remembrance of uh what happened uh which is a deliverance from bondage and um yeah, I think, you know, it's um, it not only is the uh, celebration of God's creation, but also, I believe, um, his redemption also, um, a day to remember what God had done for us. And I believe redemption comes, from, comes in different forms. It does not necessarily mean that you're once a slave, uh, but I think it 
can also mean that uh, whatever situation in your life that you are, you know, beholden to, um, God can bring you out of that situation uh, into a new, uplifted um, situation or, you know, um, condition. And uh, I think, thinking about it, I think it's good for me to take some time and uh, remember what God had done for me as he had done for the Israelites uh, thousands of years ago. So, yeah, I mean, um, um, yeah, so that's uh, what I'm uh, getting at it from today's uh, lesson, Wednesday's lesson. Okay. So, yeah, what he can do for us. Mm-hmm. Great. But what, can, can I make one quick comment sure. on that? So one thought that I had was that um, as a result of Israel's disobedience, to God, they were allowed to become slaves in Egypt. I think there's a statement somewhere in Ellen White saying that had they been ever faithful to God, they wouldn't have been in that condition of bondage. So that God was tending even by their experience of um, slavery to illustrate what sin will do to you. You're going to become a slave to sin, uh, and God is there to deliver you. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful lesson. I. I... I think the modern day application is that the, um, um, you know, it, it is okay. You know, if you make a mistake, it's okay. Just repent and turn to God and he will uh, bring you out of that uh, situation. Yeah. So what, what would you see as some examples of bondage today that people are in? Well, we can think of several. Drugs would be one. Yeah. You know, alcohol is another one. Um, bad relationship or um, it could be financial mishap um, it could be health problems or you know yeah, I mean like people that. are addicted yeah. to shopping too and mm-hmm. so they're always working because they always have to buy things they don't need mm-hmm. to impress people they don't know or something like that yeah. so then they're in bondage to the bank worse yet I think there's people who are in bondage to um, social pressure so they're always having to impress their neighbors, and also people in bondage to social media, for example. There's people who can't go without it. So, And I've seen addictions to the Internet or to gaming or so forth. Yeah. And in your line of work, you see a lot of people being held hostage by... Right, and, and it does tend to depression. So then they come to me, and when I tell them what they have to do to get rid of these things, they, they're usually not too happy to hear about that, just like their regular doctor telling them that hey, you got to give up foods you like in order to be healthier. They don't like that too much either. Yeah. Yeah. But fortunately, just as God took the children from Israel and saved them from that, he can save us from whatever bondage we're in as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Scott. Not for your righteousness. Not for your righteousness. This is kind of a sobering thought if we take it out of the context of Israel and move it to us as well. So basically God didn't choose Israel because they were so good. He he destroyed the people before them in Canaan because they were so bad. (laughs) So in other words, God had to get rid of those people, but Israel wasn't exactly perfect either. So it says, central to the Christian religion and to all biblical religion is the great theme of justification by faith alone. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Um, And then Ellen White said, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which which is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Beyond question, when you consider who God is and how holy he is, in contrast to who we are and how unholy uh, we are, it would have been an amazing act of grace to save us, and it did. That act of grace happened at the cross with Christ, the innocent one, dying for the sins of the guilty. Then it talks about in the context with this context in mind, read Deuteronomy 9, 1 through 6. 
What is Moses saying to the people here that reveals in a dramatic way the reality of God's grace, grace for the unworthy? How does what happened here reflect the principle of justification by faith? So l let's read those verses. Hear, O Israel, you are crossing the Jordan today to go and to dispossess nations greater and mightier than you, cities that are great and fortified to heaven, a people who are great and tall, the sons of Anakim, whom you know and whom you have heard of said, who can stand against the sons of Anak? For so be aware today that the Lord is um, the Lord your God who is crossing over ahead of us, uh, of you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and will subdue them before you so that you may drive them out and eliminate them quickly just as the Lord has spoken to you. Do not say in your heart when the Lord God has, given, has driven them away from you. Because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me to take possession of this land. Rather, it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord dispossessed them before you. It is not because of your righteousness or uprightness of heart that you are going to take possessions of their land, but it is because of their wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God is driving him out from before you in order to confirm the oath which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Know then that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord is giving you this good land to possess, for you are a stubborn people. Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord to anger in the wilderness from the day you left Egypt until you arrived at this place. You have been rebellious against the Lord." And then there's some interesting commentary from Patriarchs and Prophets on this as well. It says, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you are more in number than any people, uh, for you were the fewest all people, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep his oath which he swore unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen, the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Know therefore that Jehovah thy God, he is God, the faithful God which keepeth the covenant of mercy which, uh, with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. The people of Israel had been ready to ascribe their troubles to Moses, but now their suspicions that he was controlled by pride, ambition, or selfishness were removed, and they listened with confidence to his words. By the way, I was just going to make an aside on that. So I think one of the reasons we have to be completely selfless and kind and perfect is because people are going to try to ascribe those things to us. So if we are to set a good example, we have to be perfect as, as Moses was in his fear. Otherwise, um, Satan's going to take advantage of some weakness and use it against you. They had often felt impatient, rebellious because of their long wandering in the wilderness, but the Lord had not been chargeable with this delay in possessing Canaan. He was more grieved than they because he could not bring them into immediate possession of the promised land, and thus display before all nations his mighty power and the deliverance of his people. With their distrust of God, with their pride and unbelief, they had not been prepared to enter Canaan. They would in no way represent the people whose God is the Lord, for they did not bear the, his character of purity, goodness, and benevolence. Had their fathers yielded in faith to the direction of God, being governed by his judgments and walking in his ordinances, they would long before have settled in Canaan, a prosperous, holy, um, happy people. Their delay to enter the goodly land dishonored God and detracted from his glory in the sight of the surrounding nations. So I think there's a lesson in that, that every time that we do not obey the God, law, God's law or obey his direction, that we're actually bringing disrepute, not just on ourselves, but on God himself. So we're dishonoring God by not 
following his law or his commandments as he as the people of Israel did so they God was more grieved than they were that they couldn't go in because God was made to look bad and I think we have to remember that that every time we have a failure we're also badly reflecting on God's character it says Moses who understood the character and value of the law of God assured the people that no other nation had such wise righteous and merciful rules as had been given to the Hebrews Behold, he said, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do, the, uh, do so in the land whether you possess it. Keep it, therefore, and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this is a great and a wise and understanding people. So... Um, to kind of conclude, um, if one could encapsulate Paul's teaching of the gospel, perhaps it would be find, found in Deuteronomy 9.5. Not because of your righteousness or uprightness of heart is God going to save you. Instead, he's going to do it because of his promises of the everlasting gospel. Um, a promise given, not according to the works, but according to his own purpose, and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. If the promise was given us before time began, it certainly couldn't be from our works because we didn't exist before time began and thus had no works. So in spite of your fault, faults and flaws, your stiff necks, the Lord is going to do wonderful work in you. Thus, as a result, the Lord commands you to obey him and his laws. The promise already has been given and delivered. Your works, your obedience, even if they were good enough, which they aren't, aren't the means of your salvation. They are instead the result. And then I was going to end with this thought, which is that, just to think about it logically, that God's law is necessary not merely because it honors God, but because I personally wouldn't want to live in a world that was completely lawless, where everybody, like the strongest person, would win. So therefore, you would never be safe. As long, or the sneakiest. <laughs> or the sneakiest. So, so therefore, if you lived in a society where marriage was not respected, somebody stronger could take your wife, or your property wasn't respected, they could just take it from you. Or people would just lie in order to get ahead. This would be a terrible place to live if you lived like that. So um, I think it, it's an intrinsic principle that this brings um, blessing as well as safety. Thank you. Thanks. Peace. Thank you. Any final thoughts? Well, no, it's been a good, uh, good uh, lesson. Yeah, I liked it. I, um, yeah, I kind of have uh, food for thought, uh, especially the application of the God's law and the uh, principle behind it. As far uh, as you know, well as the uh, the the need for law, as uh, Scott just had mentioned, the uh, what would it be if there's no law? You know, so yeah, yeah. So my final thought to you actually is going to come from Ellen White tonight, uh, or this morning rather. I guess I need to know what time it is. Mm -hmm. Christ is the author and finisher of our faith, and this is from that I may know Him, page one sixty two. He's the author and finisher of our faith. And when we yield to his hand, we shall steadily grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. We shall make progress until we reach full stature of men and women in Christ. Faith works by love and purifies the soul, expelling love of sin that leads to rebellion against and transgression of God's law. So it's the love that brings us and understanding God's love and, and loving others as Christ would that brings us um, to um, want to get sin out of our lives. Through the agency of the Holy Spirit, the character is transformed and the mind and will of the human agent are brought into perfect conformity to the divine will and this conformity is to the divine standard of righteousness. 
So we conform when we feel his love and we follow in his will. To those who are thus transformed, Christ will say, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates of the city. And I feel that that is each of our desire, is to have our lives transformed into the character of Christ and then to rule with him forever. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we want to thank you for this wonderful study about your love, your law, your grace, without which all together in a beautiful package we would not have salvation. So we pray, Lord, that we continue to love you in a way that pushes all sin out of our lives, that we may reach that stature of men and women, that may, we may be, walk, be walking upright in your love and in your law. We look forward to that day, Father, when you will come to take us home, when we can sit around your throne and you can teach us new and wonderful things that we cannot even imagine as we sit here today. So thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. Please bless the rest of the Sabbath, and may we have a high and holy day with you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.